Hi, I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story, where we have a brand new ebook waiting for you absolutely free at businessofstory.com. It's called The Five Stages of Grief in Telling Your Business Story, How to Overcome Story Fright to Grow Your Leadership, People, and Organization. In it, we help you deal with things like denial, that story actually works, or anger, I don't know how to tell a story, bargaining, I'll do anything but tell a story, depression, I have no good stories to tell. And finally, we're going to land you on acceptance of the power of story in your life. You'll become a master storyteller when you go to businessofstory.com and download your free ebook right now. And then start living into your most potent stories. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. Are you familiar with how Winston Churchill described Russia in a radio broadcast he made in October 1939? He said, Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Once I did my research on today's guest and his marvelously eclectic background in movies, writing, propaganda, arts, science, and cannabis, for some reason Churchill's quote popped into my mind. As I was sorting out Michael Backus's background, I thought, man, this dude is a storyteller's riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Okay, so maybe the enigma part isn't quite fair, because as you will hear, Michael may be one of the most articulate geniuses we've had on the show exploring how the power of story mesmerizes and moves us storytelling apes. For over a decade, Michael worked as technical advisor to the late author Michael Crichton on book and film projects including Jurassic Park, Timeline, Disclosure, Prey, and Twister. He also co-wrote the screenplay with Crichton for Rising Sun. Backus also co-founded the American Film Institute Digital Media Studies Program and the AFI Apple Computer Center for Film and Video Makers. There, he hosted an acclaimed weekly salon at which many emerging software technologies were introduced, including QuickTime, Adobe Premiere, and others. His gift for introducing new technologies to audiences at these salons inspired Professor Peter Lunenfeld in his book, Snap to Grid, to cite Backus as a, quote, demo god of technology, alongside such luminaries as Steve Jobs and Doug Engelbart. His motion picture work has also included conceptual design and or visual effects on Jurassic Park, Spider-Man 2 and 3, and Peacemaker. Bacchus was named by Premier Magazine, along with George Lucas and Stanley Kubrick, as one of the 10 pioneers of Hollywood's digital revolution. For over 10 years, Bacchus worked on software to analyze narrative with Technical Academy Award winners Steve Greenfield and Chris Hundley. This work was conducted at USC's Information Sciences Institute on behalf of the U.S. Department of Defense and Government Intelligence Agencies. He is also a member of the 5D Institute Think Tank based at University of Southern California. California. Beginning in 2006, Michael began researching the medicinal uses of the cannabis plant, driven by a need to find an effective treatment for his intractable migraine headaches. He found relief but was surprised by the lack of solid research available on the topic. Today, he works with a Southern California consultancy that specializes in cannabis, science, and policy issues worldwide. He is the author of Cannabis Pharmacy, The Practical Guide to Medical Marijuana that was published in 2014. Cannabis Pharmacy has been the best-selling medical marijuana book on Amazon since its publication. He's been profiled in such publications as Wired, Vice, Premier, Variety, and Hollywood Reporter. See what I mean? A storytelling riddle, the mystery of which we will unwrap on today's show as he explores the importance of inspiration, relatability, and suspense in your purpose-driven brand storytelling. 
the narrative power of propaganda and how it works on us. What we might expect from the coming artificial intelligence age, the storytelling singularity, which happens to be on our doorstep, by the way. How to overcome an anti-story, which he most recently had to do with his work and his book, Cannabis Pharmacy, and much, much more. I know, that is a ton to cover in 60 minutes, so let's get started. Michael, welcome to the show. So great having you here. Hey, thanks, Park. Nice to be here. Now, I got to tell you, you may be our single most eclectic storytelling guest yet. You've done a ton in the world in story, in Hollywood, in film, in digital, in cannabis, of all things. Maybe they all go hand in hand. Real quickly, give us your background. But more importantly, what I'm curious about to start the show is can you take us to a moment in your life, and it often happens when you're a kid, that shapes who you are today and what you do today, something that was just so pivotal you've never forgotten it? Sure. Yeah. I I mean, I think the pivotal moment for me was when I was about eight years old, my dad was a university professor at a state university in Idaho. And he introduced me to Eli Obler, who was the head librarian for the university library. And Obler kind of took me under his wing and would just walk me through the library and shove books into my hands that he thought I'd be interested in. And it gave me this lifelong love of storytelling, of books that just stuck with me. And it's just just kind of seminal. I mean, it was just, I think the first time he like let me into the rare book room and just left left me alone to like look at all these books. It was What's, What's like one of the first books you remember from being that little? Oh, I think it was, I think it was, a, they, they had a first edition of Treasure Island, the Robert Louis Stevenson book. And it's funny too, because later when I worked with Michael Crichton, the writer, Treasure Island was a big influence on his writing as well. <laughs> so there, great writing, fabulous storytelling, wonderful journey it took you on. And I suppose at eight years old, it started to uh, light up that theater of your mind and got you to where you are today. Is that fair enough to For say? Sure. No. For sure. Sure. I'm a big believer. I haven't been studying it since eight. I've been studying. I started actually studying music when I was eight and how it all came together. But my storytelling fascination came in the early 2000s. And I found that these two worlds really play together. You know, how a great composition is actually you know put together and how a great story is put together. And one of the things and I'm curious if you've seen this, Michael, that I has really now hit me upside the head is in this day and age when everybody's talking about story and storytelling that folks are out there looking for this big epic story to tell when in reality they should be looking for their scenes or their moments that have really shaped who they are today. And once you really get in connection with those scenes or moments, then the story kind of finds you. Yeah, I I, uh, hosted this conference for a few years in Portland called the Portland Creative Conference. And what they would do is they'd invite people to come in and talk about their creative process. And they got Gary Larson, the cartoonist, to come in one time. He's from my neck of the woods. You know, he's up there, the the Palouse, where you grew up. You around, did you say Idaho State University? Uh Uh-huh, in Pocatello. Yeah, in Pocatello. Uh Well, he went to WSU, Washington State University, just across the uh, border from University of Idaho. Wazoo is where I happen to have gone to school. So, sorry, little connection there. So Larson gets up on stage and goes, I have no idea what inspires my creativity and story process in my work. (laughs) And then he proceeds to tell a story about his childhood where his father used to love to put on costumes and scare the hell out of the kids (laughs) (laughs) and would like hide in the closet And they would go out and collect animals together by the creek. And all of these things that show up in Gary Larson's cartoons, scary animals, et cetera, et cetera, are just pepper his childhood. (laughs) And obviously were enormous. And just from his crazy dad dressing up and scaring the hell out of the kids. I think it's great. I love it. So my kids actually have a future ahead of them. Awesome. So there you go. give us a little bit of background because I went through your intro and tried to cover the, the ground that you have in a very brief amount of time. How does how has your world come together in storytelling and all of these different facets? Well, let's see. I guess it begins when I first got into the motion picture business. I worked for a small movie studio in LA, small independent studio, and I got obsessed with personal computers and their potential impact on the film business. So are you talking like in the 80s here or 90s? Uh In the 80s, like 1984, 85. I was working on 
a couple of movies. I worked on Dirty Dancing, the, and then I worked on The Dead, John Huston's oh, last, yeah. uh, or one of John Huston's last films. And what was interesting was I was really fascinated by whether or not personal computers could have an impact on how we make movies. And at the time, everybody just thought they were a gimmick and they were never going to be used. So they weren't real tools. And I got into visual effects with them and with these small personal computers. I started working with Apple. And then I heard about some guys in LA who were doing software for screenwriting and Chris Hunley and Steve Greenfield. And they ended up uh, develop, work, starting to work on this program called Dramatica. And incredibly complex storytelling program, but there's kind of something in it. And I just got obsessed with looking at computers and how computers could be used to analyze narrative. And at the same time, just was, you know, a, a, a hopelessly addicted reader, loved books, and just kind of these things started to merge where I'd look at how computers could analyze narratives to see if you could potentially use a computer to come up with a better narrative. And did they ever do anything with Dramatica? Is it still around or some sort of version? Yeah, of it? I ended up, actually, yeah, I ended up doing something. It's interesting. We ended up doing a project for years at USC with the US government to look at the narratives of America's enemies <laughs> and how you could potentially use software to come up with better, better narratives. In other words, it was basically computer-assisted propaganda. And did it work? I mean, did you come up yeah, with Yeah, it worked some? pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you give us an example without having to kill us? Yeah, I mean, well, it's just really interesting. Apparently, the Taliban. Well, actually, I'll give you an even better one. This is this is an easier one. So you'll remember a few years ago there was a there was a controversy about a church minister down in Florida who had burned a Koran, and it resulted in. I mean, <laughs> this guy did this thing in this backwater town in Florida, and all of a sudden there are riots in Pakistan, and so. Um, the question that was put to us is, what would the software predict is the story you have to tell to counteract that narrative? How do you calm that situation down through storytelling? And the software predicted something kind of unexpected, which is the way to minimize the impact of somebody burning a Koran is to put it in that incident inside of a bigger tent, inside of a bigger story. So you, what you would do is you'd have somebody burn a Talmud and burn a Bible and burn, a, in other words, all at the same time, so that, that the incendiary nature of that act of desecrating a Koran gets put in a larger perspective and doesn't have as much impact. And that was something that the computer came up with. This wasn't something that the people working on the project came up. It's almost like AI way ahead of itself, artificial intelligence back in the mid 80s and is able to somehow tease out emotion in that and, and, and arrive at something as surprising as simply put this action into a larger tent or a larger context, I guess, for lack of a better term. Right. And that's the thing I was found fascinating about Dramatica is Dramatica would have these kind of... Dramatica said that there was a kind of a bound, an, an outside bound to the story universe in the sense that there were only so many different structures of stories. There were an infinite numbers of stories that could be told, but there were a finite number of structures that those stories would be told within, which I thought was an interesting idea. And that was the kind of the fundamental premise of Dramatica. And honestly, I, I'd never seen anything that countered it. It was a really kind of a lot of structures. I mean, they say there are like 32,000 different structures that you can tell an infinite number of stories in. Well, and the one I think about is the hero's journey. You know, that, exactly. that, so that's one very prominent structure, but apparently not the only one. For sure. And I was a big Joseph Campbell fan. I mean, uh, who isn't? I mean, it's pretty easy to get on board because it's really tapping to something that's truly primal. And what about the seven basic plots by Christopher Booker? I mean, he kind of says, well, there's really only seven primary stories and from these that you can launch into anything. Exactly. And I mean, and I think people will be teasing out this approach for a long time until some real heavy duty AI comes in and says, well, actually, Here's the way it really is. Yeah. <laughs> because I think now that these now that now that you have these machine learning systems that can go in and analyze text, one of the things we did with the Dramatica project was we worked with the guys at IBM who were doing Watson, the AI that could play Jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because you could see in those early days, about ten years ago, where Watson was going to end up being a really big deal, that these machine learning things were actually going to eventually probably help us tell stories because they could analyze stories so fast. 
Yeah, I've been reading this really great book right now called The Hitmakers by Derek Thompson. Yeah, it's a great book. I've read oh, it. You, okay, you've been through it. So I'm, I've been really fascinated by it. By the way, it's totally let the creative air out of our son Parker over in Hollywood. He's like, no, it's all about creativity and we have to you know, find new ways to tell these stories and whatever. And he's kind of in The Hitmakers saying the exact opposite. He says, start with the familiar and then become very creative on how you tell and talk about the familiar. Familiar being stories that people already recognize and can relate to, but now tell them in novel ways. Do you agree with that? Oh, completely. And the reason is, is that basically when you have a skeleton with which you're familiar, you're basically doing the brain's work for it. Your brain knows that structure. And then it becomes how you tell the story. And so a lot of people confuse kind of a story framework with a story, and they're totally different things. How do you define them? Well, I mean, basically the way I think about it is, is it's literally one's the Christmas tree and the storytelling are the bulbs on the tree. It's how it's decorated. And it's, what is it? It's, what did they used to call it? There used to be a thing in Dungeons and Dragons back in the day where they were talking about, oh, dr dungeon dressing. So storytelling becomes dungeon dressing, not dungeon design. And so it's how you how you basically populate the world becomes the storytelling versus the where are the walls, where are the staircases, where are the traps? That's the dungeon design. And that's the story structure. Now, in Derek Thompson's book, again, The Hitmakers, he talks about this guy that maybe you're aware of. I hadn't heard of him before. Vincent, um, and I'm going to totally butcher this, Brutsacy. <laughs> Vincent? No, I don't remember him from the book. STX Entertainment, and he says that he is basically a social psychologist, but has done thousands, researched thousands and thousands of people watching all these different movies to be, see if he can't predict behavior and figure out exactly what kinds of stories to tell, you know, to make hit makers, basically, to try to predict them for Hollywood. Well, that's that's actually there's a there's a highly I don't remember the name of it. There's a highly secretive company in the UK that has all of the major studios, I believe now, as clients that basically is running AIs on stories to predict hits before they're produced. The thing I'm concerned about that is is that it ends up with a certain kind of homogenous product where it's a little too formulaic. I'm noticing that recently in some of the Marvel films that they're you're starting to figure them out. Well yeah. before the ending. I was doing a workshop at Social Media Marketing World a couple of weeks ago, and I was taking uh, the audience, about 500 people, through my story cycle process, which is simply Campbell's Hero's Journey Map to Business. And instead of 17 or so steps, mine is 10 steps that you can use for either high-level brand strategy, or you can also use the exact same thing right down to the actual execution of a piece of creative and somebody in the crowd said, oh my God, the story cycle is every Marvel film ever made. <laughs> and I'm going, yeah, you know, because they follow that same formula. I simply took the same, the framework and now mapped it to business. But people are seeing that now and it is, it's so formulaic. All they're doing is changing the character and the masks and the adventures. I mean, everything else kind of is the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. And I mean, I, I, you know, somebody said wisely a couple of years ago, I was reading something that basically sa says that a corporation is nothing but a story that a bunch of people agree. Yeah, upon. Isn't that the truth? And it really is. It really is. And it shows you the power of narrative in business, because the truth is, is if you you really can change the culture of a company or a business strategy by changing the story that underlies it. But <laughs> people in business and executives you know, poo-poo story. It's too woo-woo for them. It's a soft skill and they don't want to have any part of it. Let's just get down to the brass tacks of the bottom line thinking and what's going on here. Until they, want, of course, want to launch a product or they want to energize their company. And then whether they believe in it, in other words, it doesn't make any difference whether or not you believe in Santa Claus as long as the presents show up. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And how are you going to under the Christmas tree with the stories that, that ornament the framework? So I like where we're going here with this. But the thing is, too, is you got to believe in it. And the only way that I think people are going to believe in it is when they actually experience it and they see it come to life when they tell a story in a room, even if they feel awkward or vulnerable in the telling of that story, especially in a business environment, how they can move an audience. And then that's kind of when their holy crap moment hits. I'm like, whoa, that was like way more powerful than I thought it was going to be. 
For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of these things where you definitely know it when you see it. So you kind of came then at the rightful age of eight years old from academia, library, reading classics and being able to dissect story. You got in it, started through Dramatica and some of these folks working with it. How did you then, how did that lead into working with Michael Crichton where you worked on what, Jurassic Park and Timeline Disclosure? Tell us a little bit about how that came about and the work you did there. Sure. So I met Michael's girlfriend, soon to be wife, and she introduced us and we both kind of nerded out on technology together. So we were both into Macintosh computers and how to use them. Michael had bought back in the 70s, a $100,000 word processor, the first home or business word processor. And he wrote a book on a word processor you know, five or six years before anybody was doing that. And so he'd always been out on the cutting edge. I loved the cutting edge of technology. And so we would just have these long, wide ranging discussions. And one day we were at lunch and he was working on a book about Ben Franklin. And we were talking about it. And he, as an aside, told me this idea that he had had 10, 15 years before for a movie about dinosaurs, about resurrecting dinosaurs from from fossil DNA. And I just literally just flipped out over the idea. I just thought it was just one of the best ideas I'd ever heard in my life. And he went and told Mike Ovitz, who was this agent at CAA, about it. And Mike got excited about it and obviously had more impact than my <laughs> excitement. And Michael wrote the book and we just started hanging out. And um, he asked me to write Rising, the screenplay for Rising Sun with him and I helped him a bit on Twister with a couple sections of the screenplay where he needed to condense a bunch of exposition down to a single page. And yeah, so I just got into it. And I had worked with a guy before I met Michael, I'd worked with a guy named Ron Cobb, who was a conceptual designer in Hollywood, who started out as a cartoonist and then ended up designing like the bar scene in Star Wars and the temple opening for Raiders of the Lost Ark and the DeLorean for Back to the Future. And he was just this incredibly creative guy who kind of sparked my interest in coming up with cool ideas to stick into movies. So I would work with Michael to come up with little science tidbits that he might toss into his stories on top of the thousands that he came up with on his own. And yeah, I worked with Michael for about 20 years. Well, and it's brilliant how he started Jurassic Park and with that little animation about just kind of setting the whole premise of how this could actually happen. Yeah. Uh, w were you a part of that or was that just all of his own doing as well? Well, actually, that that was just in the movie screenplay. In the book, it was it was much more kind of prose oriented. But for the movie, they came up with the introduction of the park to just explain it. And Spielberg, obviously, is a genius at explaining things visually. And so that little intro in the ride in the park was created by Spielberg. And I think it was David Kep who was the screenwriter for that version of the script. Yeah. I designed the control room for the movie. I was a um, display graphics supervisor on the film. And it's weird too, because Crichton put my name in the book, Jurassic Park, just as kind of a joke as the chief programmer of the park. <laughs> What's funny was somebody working on the movie adaptation recognized my name and called me in and I got hired to design the control room for the movie. So I'm the first fictional character to ever get a job on a film. Oh, man, that's that's a heck of a story. I, now, you had said something earlier. I want to come back because this is going to be a writing tip for me and hopefully all the listeners. But before I ask you what that tip is, how did you make the transition into writing and script writing and, and screen play tweaking? Oh, hanging around with Crichton. I Is mean, what it was? You know, I, was yeah. really interested, I was really interested in writing and I'd written a couple of scripts, not particularly well. But was fascinated by it. I mean, it's a really, I mean, screenwriting is really, really, really tough. I mean, I think for some people it's easy, but I just found it to be, it's, it's such a formal structure and kind of trope that it's, it's like writing lyric poetry. You really have to kind of, you know, color within the lines. You can tell an infinite number of stories within those lines, but it's, yeah, it's, it's really a challenge, but that's how I got into it. I just got into it by just hanging around Crichton and watching him do it. And then you got in there and he came to you and said, Hey, I've got this long exposition happening and I need to boil it down to one page. Yeah, actually before that, I actually, I wrote the screenplay for rising sun before that, before Twister. But yeah, on Twister, that's what I did. Okay, so help us with that because we all do that. We all get long-winded. My students I taught over at ASU, I was always like, brevity, man. You know, you can say this in, in one 
sentence instead of an entire paragraph. What are the tips for us to be able to take long expo- exposition and boil it down to one fast moving page of copy content? Yeah, you really first have to figure out what your central point is. So it, for Twister, what it was, was Michael was trying to explain how the gizmo that was going to get sucked up in the tornado worked. And he, and what happened is he got kind of lost in the detail of what went into the making of it and the components of it, when in fact, the essential element was, what does this thing do? And so, and, and so you really have to distill and not get lost in the expository morass of trying to answer every journalistic question about what you're talking about and get to the central, we're going to throw this thing up into a tornado and it's going to collect data. And it's, and, and it's strong enough that it can resist the forces inside the tornado. And that's kind of it. And you just, you just basically dress that up a little bit rather than saying it was built in a factory in Florida and then trucked up here to, you know, and you don't get into all the detail. You, you have to borrow the old Dorothy Parker line and kill all your darlings. All the little fascinating facts may not fit in the story. I mean, if you've got the room to digress like you can in a novel, then you maybe can spend four pages explaining it. But if in a film, you know, you may have, you know, 20 seconds of screen time and and that's expensive screen time and valuable as far as you don't necessarily want to fill it up with a bunch of needless exposition. So you need to, how to know how to cut stuff down. Okay. And here's a marketing moment because this is what we talk about in brand storytelling too, is it is it, just exemplified in what you just said. It's not about what you make, but what you make happen. So he was all caught up in how does this thing made and how's it shipped in and what, what's it look like? But you were saying, no, man, we just got to get down to what does it do? And let's then throw it up in the tor- tornado. It's not what you make, but what you make happen. Right. And, and I mean, I think you see that. I mean, ideally, I mean, obviously, Apple that's constantly you know cited as being top of the game in this is really, really good in getting the essential message out about yeah. the product. Now you went on and I don't know what year was it that you co-founded the American Film Institute Digital Media Studies program. What was that and and how did it impact Hollywood? So it was a place basically where people could come and learn how to use personal computers to make motion pictures. So we had the first course in Photoshop, we had the first course in After Effects. We did the premiere of QuickTime, Apple's video. Kodak. And we basically just taught classes and taught people how to cut films and make films with computers. We started that, let's see, right before I started working on Jurassic Park. So it was probably 1990. 1990. So that was, yeah, pretty rudimentary uh, editing tools at that point, but I suppose seemed very advanced for the time. Yeah. I mean, Avid had just shown up basically. And Avid was a very kind of expensive, dedicated system. But, you know, you weren't, you weren't cutting movies yeah. on laptops. Oh, I had my first sure. Avid. I was doing a lot of editing, or, or well, video production work when I first launched my ad agency in 1995. And at the time, the first few years, I was going into edit bays, of course, and these people that own these edit bays had spent a million dollars, literally plus, making them so they would work. Well, then the Avid came out and my wife had great faith in me. We put down $110,000 of money we did not have on our very first Avid system, but I could see the payback on it because I was having to spend what, 150, 200 bucks an hour of my and my client's money in these edit bays. And man, I rolled that Avid in and we started working on that. Next thing I know, I think I ended up owning four Avids, and we were absolutely cranking stuff out. It was just so much fun to see how, I guess, the democratization of production came to us. And we started experiencing that in about 97 with Avid. And then they just got cheaper and cheaper. Now, of course, everybody can do the exact same thing on their laptops. Yeah. And it's fascinating too, because I mean, it's, there's a real interesting peek behind the curtain into the future. And Max Tegmark is a physicist at uh, MIT, and he has a new book called Life 3.0. And there's ex- this extraordinary story in the opening about what the world looks like when a computer gets super intelligent, which has, you know, been a story that's been in science fiction movies, you know, going back to the Mm -hmm. 40s probably. But it's a really, really compelling story because what this company in Silicon Valley, this mythical company, decides to do is crack storytelling. And so what it does is the company, they don't tell anybody they're doing it. They start putting stuff up on YouTube with stories that have been written by the computer and they're super compelling. And all of a sudden, within months, this little company becomes one of the world's largest media companies and it's powered by an AI. How far away do you think we are from that actually happening? 
probably closer than we imagine. You know, the thing is, is there's, there's a fantastic book by Chris Surf called The Expert Speak, where they, they talk about forecasting and how poorly it works. <laughs> and almost everybody always says, oh, that'll take 30 years and it's here in three. So I got a feeling it's coming really, really fast. Well, you guys kind of uh, you know demonstrate that with Dramatica, I guess. A lot of people would say, and the pushback on AI is that, well, it doesn't have feeling and caring and empathy and that sort of thing. It can only, like Spock, you know, on Star Trek, be able to compute things. But you proved, it sounds like early on with Dramatica, that that's not the case. That it can actually connect this stuff. Again, again, and l- let me emphasize this because again, the Dramatica can help you with the story structure, but the storytelling, that's that thats that thing right now that we really have kind of a lock on. And I think computers will help us, but they're way behind the curve right now. And so the thing is, is that, you know, you can teach a computer the rules to play chess or go, but teaching it, you know, how to write Harry Potter, that's another thing altogether. And now it may be able to help you with the structure of Harry Potter, but I think as far as now coming up with the actual storytelling, I think that's a few years off. I think what it'll do, it'll, it'll be a really good assistant and it'll help us look for patterns in stories because computers are fantastic at that. But I think it's going to be a while before computers, you know, you sit on your computer's knee and get told a story. So we're a ways away from the singularity of story then. We're okay. Yeah, I think that's actually going to be one of the things that humans do really well for a really long time. Thank God. I hate, I would hate to shutter business of story after just a couple, you know, fleeting <laughs> years. That's good to hear. So patterns of stories, you've seen them since you were eight years old and you worked and you in Hollywood, you brought digital to it. What are some of the patterns of stories that our human minds see and just seem to love and patterns that we can be using in our branding and our marketing and maybe even most importantly, in our leadership within organizations to help us get people to buy in to that purpose-driven story within a corporation? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think good stories and wherever they show up, whether they show up in movies or in a, in, within, you know, a company, they're disruptive. And I think that, that I, I, I like them, you know, the magic trick payoff. I like the idea that you basically set somebody up and then surprise them pleasantly. In movies, you can surprise them unpleasantly or scare the hell out of them. But in, in companies, that's typically not a, the best idea. But I think, I think this idea of, of, you know, how do we, how do you basically set up the punchline and surprise someone becomes really, really a crucial part of storytelling. The best storytellers really are the ones where they set it up so you don't see the surprise coming. They know how to to basically control attention. It's funny, for a while when I first got into storytelling software, I was also really, really obsessed with how stage magicians direct the audience's attention because the truth is that's exactly what a storyteller does and so if you're if you're trying to get people to buy into your narrative you're trying to capture their attention and then direct it in a particular you know vector and so the thing for me that really becomes interesting is what are the tricks that we can learn so you really can genuinely surprise someone and so there are things there are lots of stuff from coming from neuroscience now about the neuroscience of attention that potentially could provide us with some clues for making better stories. And what have you found that works? Well, change blindness is one that's really interesting. So the thing is, is that there's this concept of change blindness where your brain actually is making most of its reality, the present reality, out of memory, out of stuff from the past, stuff it's stored, because your brain only has so much bandwidth And so what it does is it paints the picture of the room you're in so your brain doesn't have to create it at every second. And it paints it out of your experience with that. And what's fascinating about that is if you introduce a change into that environment, people won't notice it for a moment until you direct their attention specifically to it. It's the classic thing where you don't see the scary person behind the heroine for a moment. And then it gives you that huge jump scare when you realize they're there. It's because your brain painted it without them there and it took you a moment to notice it. And setting up surprises like that in your storytelling is super effective because it's, it's fresh. It's novel. It's, I mean, it's the definition of novel. 
So you're basically hacking the brain if you know this, that the brain is painting that scenario. And it goes back to what you're saying uh, before, that you have to make it easy for the brain. Story structure makes it easy for people to follow along, and then you deliver up the novelty or the surprises. Your buddy, and I know you bunk in with there, and a good friend of mine, Dr. Randy Olson, who writes Houston, we have a narrative, the creator of the ABT and all. He talks about the brain is just simply lazy. It does not want to burn calories and energy. It wants to conserve that for the, the conservation of our being for survival, basically. So don't make people think too much with your stories, but then surprise them. Is that is that kind of where you're going with this? Well, yeah, but also you could real. I mean, look, there are great storytellers out there. I'm thinking of playwright Tom Stoppard, who takes on really, really tough science concepts and really makes you think, but knows how to weave that in in a way that it's not, it doesn't glaze you over. It, he keeps you engaged. He knows the amount that you can take in and be tickled um, without being overwhelmed and, you know, being boring, basically. Yeah. I think of J.J. Abrams, too. I think he does a great job with that. And have you seen his TED Talk on the mystery box? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's great. I mean, and, I mean, he's a, it's funny. I mean, I heard, I first heard about J.J., from Polly Platt, who used to work with uh, James Brooks. And, uh, you know, J.J. was considered like a child prodigy of storytelling when he showed up. His first screenplays, everybody he pitched them to, were, they were just shocked at how good and compelling the stories were. And yeah, I mean, he's kind of an Amadeus of story in some degree. <laughs> and there's no accident. There's no accident that he's involved in the Star Wars universe right now, which is one of our central myths Mm -hmm. He's just a really talented guy. So what else do you do? You've got this change blindness. What else have you seen that works and that something that may work in the corporate world and the marketing world to surprise people and keep them to, to direct their attention? Well, it's funny. Something I learned from Crichton, Crichton was really, you know, speaking of Treasure Island and Michael Crichton, you know, books like Treasure Island or um, stories like Sherlock Holmes stories, Michael would mine those for ideas, for narratives, for contemporary stories. So he'd basically... I mean, you could say that his novel Congo is an update of Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mines, because it is. And so what I like to do is I like to look at resonant stories from the past and figure out elements of them that might provide structure for stories I want to tell today. I mean, that's what Joseph Campbell does. He looks at, you know, commonalities in, in how myths have influenced how we tell ourselves about the world. So what are you doing this day and age? So you, you went from screenwriting and worked there in the digital world. And what are you now doing? You're down at Paramount Studios, right? Bunking in down there and doing work in this area? I'm doing work. And then also, I mean, I've been spending a lot of time working on the emerging industry of cannabis, which is a totally, well, it's actually, when I explain why I'm doing it, it'll make sense. I, I was really fascinated by the impact that technology computers had on Hollywood when nobody said they would have an impact on Hollywood. I'm interested in cannabis, a plant that we used for 12,000 years and basically became illegal at the beginning of the 20th century, kind of reintroducing it appropriately into society from a science standpoint. And so I'm having to do a lot of, I'm having to basically change the story that we've told ourselves about cannabis. I mean, I grew up with, you know, drug abuse classes in, in high school and, and always being warned and never heard the other side of the story, which was that, you know, this plant medicine had been used for, for literally thousands of years without, you know, hurting anybody. And so, um, yeah, so I got into the storytelling of cannabis, basically. And I've been doing that for about five or six years now. And what got you into that? I mean, what was the thing that really pushed you? Well, I had a, it's weird, I had a kind of migraine that really didn't respond to conventional prescription medications. In fact, they were kind of, the conventional prescription medications were kind of dangerous. And so my doctor said, you know something, yeah, it's kind of weird, but maybe you should try, you know, marijuana for this because I, I think it might actually might help you. And I did. And what was wild is I didn't have to use a lot. I mean, literally I could use like a puff and I'd get, you know, one tenth the number of headaches per month with like just taking a puff a couple times a week. So I take it you weren't a big Hollywood user of cannabis prior to this then? Not in the slightest. <laughs> I was I was a complete straight arrow nerd. And did you have to like change your story? Because I know the exact story you're talking about. We grew up 
with it too. And oh my God, you know, pot's going to lead to hard drugs. And my dad used to literally load seven of us kids up in the town and country station wagon and would drive us down to the university district in Seattle, Washington, drive through the, the campus there and you'd see bums and whatever and hippies. This is back in the hippie day. And then he'd take us down to Skid Road and he you would see drunks and bums, you know, sleeping underneath the, the park benches there. And he would say, kids, if you drink too much or start smoking marijuana, this is what's going to happen to you. And I, we were scared straight in the back of a town and country. Yeah. And I mean, the, the thing about it is for me is, is that, is that I, I think that these things actually, the drugs really can cause harms, including cannabis can cause harms, except if you know how to use them correctly. Mm-hmm. And so the thing is, is that, you know, we all know people who develop problems with alcohol. We all know people who've developed problems with cannabis or other drugs. And the thing is, is that, but there are lots of people who do not. And the question is, what is the commonality among those who can successfully integrate it into their lives and those who cannot. It's not for everybody. And and so the with anything, it's coming up with the appropriate narrative to make sure that as little harm is done as possible. And you wrote a book in 2014, Cannabis Pharmacy, the Poli- or the Practical Guide to Medical Marijuana. Yeah, and it's uh it's been kind of the best-selling book on uh on cannabis uh, on Amazon for 3 years. And so it was this book about what you had found from treating your migraines and then the research that went into that, the relief you actually got? To, was that the, the thinking behind this? It was even bigger than that. It was kind of like an encyclopedia. The, the thing is, is that it's really become a hot topic in the research community in the last 10 years because we've started to figure out how cannabis actually works. It turns out that your body has a system called the endocannabinoid system that basically makes its own marijuana and uses it as kind of a thermostat for all these different processes within the body. And that just was discovered in 1990. And, and so now that this research is being done, we can start to understand, oh, you can use cannabinoids produced by the cannabis plant to mimic your body's own compounds to restore balance in certain parts of your body. For example, for me, it was getting some balance for how my brain worked so that I wouldn't develop migraine headaches. And yeah, it just seems to work. So you're able to then bring in your storytelling background, your digital work in Hollywood to now repackage, rebrand cannabis through your own experience, through your own research. How have you used story? And did you put it, this story in a greater tent to be able to make it be accepted in the public out there? Yeah. So one of the things that we did and exactly that was to not focus so much on cannabis, but focus on the system with which it works, the endocannabinoid system. And so what the way I describe it is, is that cannabis is the arrow, the endocannabinoid system is the target. And this story gets really, really interesting. We start to focus more on the target rather than the arrow. And then again, so it goes back to, it's not what we make cannabis, but what we make happen, that target in the endocannabinoid system. Okay. And so then you are introducing these compounds in, and I guess you are helping the body out. You're just, you're you're bringing more, you're amplifying what the body may not be making enough of in order to bring balance so that people can have more success, more health with it. Right. And, and what's really interesting is, is it, and to avoid the, you know, bums, out by the campus problem, you really, we don't have much dose guidance out there for cannabis. And because it's relatively non-toxic, people have a tendency, if they use it, to use way too much of it. And a lot of people who've tried it and put it aside, put it aside because they had a bad reaction when they took too much of it. And the thing that I'm trying to tell people in the book is, this is much more interesting if you dramatically reduce your dose. Yeah, and, and it used to be too back in the ninth grade. You know, you'd buy the little you know bag of weed, and it was half full of seeds, and you 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 were just smoking some sort of junk off of someone's backyard. But in this day and age, it's just like weaponized. I mean, the cannabis you can get, they've got it designed to treat all kinds of things, and you're never quite sure what you're taking. Right, and and the thing is, is that the average the average potency of cannabis has gone from about three percent in the '60s to close to thirty percent today. And but the guidance for using it hasn't caught up. So when somebody who smoked it back in the day tries this new stuff, they're taking the same dose. So it's like they went from drinking a beer back in the day to drinking a bottle of tequila, yeah. but nobody told them <laughs> that, that it'd gone from beer to tequila. So you, you have to adjust your dose. And if you do, it's much easier to use. It. You know, in business storytelling, we talk a lot about using stories versus facts and data to overcome anti-stories. 
So in your case, the anti story is, oh, you know, that cannabis is just simply a gateway drug to heroin and all kinds of horrible stuff. How do you overcome that using the cannabis as a arrow? You've got your endo, I got to keep saying that, endocannabinoid as your target. Give us an example of how you overcome some of those anti-stories. Well, the thing is, is that the first thing you do is I find with the anti-stories is you don't reject them. Yeah, you've got to embrace them. Say, I hear you, basically. Not only I hear you, but that you have to acknowledge the truth in them. Okay. In other words, cannabis can be addicting if you use it too often and too much. And if you use the wrong form of it too often and too much. And you have to actually embrace because the people who are coming up with the anti-narratives are actually coming up with valid points. And the mistake is just saying, oh, that's all nonsense. Marijuana is a plant can't possibly hurt you, which is as much nonsense as some of the anti-narratives. And so you have to, you have to find the truth and acknowledge it. And it sounds a little pat, but I think it's really true. Yeah, well, uh, it builds that understanding and that empathy. And I suppose it really helps you find that common ground in the argument. You get them agreeing that the fact that you're agreeing with some of their points, and then you can take those points on by demonstrating human impact through other stories and other storytelling. Yeah, I mean, I've been working with Randy for the last couple of weeks on a, a podcast he's been doing about climate change. And what's fascinating about it is, is that the anti-narrative for people who don't believe that climate change is impacting the world is really strong and very effective. And even people who believe in climate change may not believe that it's urgent to deal with it. And so looking at how Randy's using his narrative tools to kind of take on the anti-narrative without just dismissing it outright. It's it's really, really helpful. Yeah, and his narrative tools are the end button, therefore. Very, very, right. very, very powerful story structure. So let's talk about the ABT for a second here because I used it, rolled it out in a very, very simple form again a couple of weeks ago at Social Media Marketing World, and that audience just lapped it up. They just loved it because it's such simple but powerful narrative form. Now that you're aware of it, you know, Randy, I uncovered it a few years back and it teaches scientists how to use it. Is it something that you had been aware of or was it kind of an aha moment to you when you look back on all the story, screenwriting, movie, book work you've done? Well, I mean, I think what Randy's done is he's come up with an essential element. And, and so the thing is, is that, yeah, I was using versions of it in the macro, but I hadn't distilled it down to the degree that Randy has. And what's great about Randy's approach is, is that it really does. I want to come up with the most compelling story I can come up with. And he avoids the two extremes, which is the boring extreme and the confusing extreme. And I always found the thing that Crichton was great about was he was great at staying right down the center of interesting and compelling. And he could take something kind of dull and make it really, really interesting. And to me, that's just the game. So I, I'm starting to use ABT now in on the micro level in just looking at how I construct presentations or pitches to the macro level, which is if I'm going to start a new company, what's going to be the story of that company and what's going to be the narrative? Because I really do buy into this idea that, that a company is nothing more than a story yeah. that everybody agrees on. And with all your work in story and now you're in the cannabis world and all the research and understanding how the body works and the human want, mind works, are you a big believer? As you, stop, you often hear people say, our brains are hardwired for story. I mean, does it ultimately just come down to we have a system that uses story as software, first and foremost, to create meaning out of life? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that there's no question whatsoever that from an evolutionary standpoint that you know, you, you got to figure out how the world works to survive in the world. And so you come up with a story about how the world works to survive in the world. And I think that what's great is, is when you start to craft your own personal narrative or the narrative of your organization, it, it, it pays big benefits. One, it's easier to share your enthusiasm for how you look at things if you do it within a compelling story structure. I mean, if I'm trying to tell somebody, if I'm trying to change somebody's mind, my dad was a classical rhetorician, so he basically studied and taught the science of argument. And the one thing that he got from growing up in that kind of environment was you better have a pretty solid argument for what you're going to talk about or your de my dad would just tear it apart. And I think that that's something I've taken with me my entire life, which is you better have a pretty compelling story to tell or nobody's going to listen to it or they're not going to understand it. 
Yeah, that's what it ultimately comes down to. So what is your story now? Are you working in cannabis? Are you doing other things out in Hollywood? Or what is, where, where is your story taking you? Well, let's see. I mean, I, I worked on the Spider-Man movies with uh, Sam Raimi. And then I worked on one of the reboot Spider-Man movies. And I did a little work on the first Iron Man movie. So I was doing a little bit of stuff in the Marvel world for a while. Doing what? What were you doing? I, I was doing conceptual design. So I was designing bad guys. <laughs> I was taking the bad guys from the original comic books. Uh, for example, on Spider-Man 2, uh, the Dr. Octopus character. So back in the, the original comic books in the 60s, he had those arms to manipulate uranium and you know nuclear materials. And there really wasn't any such thing at that point as AI or anything. And the idea was to update that technology for the storytelling within Spider-Man 2. So I came up with the logic that was used in the screenplay to explain how the arms worked. And more importantly, how that when they when they kind of took over Doc Ock, what was going on, what what happened, and this idea that 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 he was trying to get the AIs to be faster, and so what he did was he took off the effective governors that controlled them and made them autonomous, and they took him over, and and so that's the kind of stuff I would come up with for these movies. So now you are a prosthetic engineering as <laughs> consultant, screenwriter yeah. consultant. Yeah. <laughs> is there anything you cannot do in story? <laughs> no, no, it's just, it's just, I like stories. I mean, I, it comes out of a love of books and yeah, I mean, I just, I love storytelling. I love movies. I love books. I've always loved them and I love to be surprised by them. Yeah. And so now I get to occasionally craft a few surprises. Awesome. So can you surprise us with a couple of ideas that maybe our audience has never heard coming from your very unique background on how they can be using story more profoundly in their own personal brand story, as well as in their organizational story? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you something that came from my work in Dramatica. And it's really, really cool. And that is how propaganda really works. Now, it's nice to have a little background on propaganda because Propaganda was the original term for public relations that uh, Bernays came back came up with in the 20s, working with his uncle, Sigmund Freud. And the thing that's wild about it was, is that he changed it to public relations when the Nazis grabbed the term propaganda. And so then, then public relations emerges. But the thing that Dramatica tells us about propaganda and how it works is that it's really interesting is if you want propaganda to work, construct the narrative so that the audience comes to the conclusion to which you're trying to drive them rather than you telling them. So let me give you an example. The example would be, let's say I want you to eat a marshmallow. Okay. But I'm not going to tell you to eat the marshmallow. I want to show you cocoa and have me drop a marshmallow into it without even mentioning it and eat a marshmallow. have a big smile on my face, but I'm not saying eat a marshmallow. All I'm trying to do is expose you to enough that you go, you know, I really want a marshmallow. And the reason that that is so powerful and the reason that propaganda that uses that technique is powerful is the person who thinks they've come up with the idea owns it. So there's no convincing involved. They literally like, oh, yeah, I thought of this. I own it. And I think that that is an incredibly underused storytelling technique. People are way too on the nose and try to tell people what to do when you really ideally want them to come to the realization of what to do. And when I hear you describe that marshmallow going into the cocoa, emotionally, I see it. I literally picture it in my mind. So what you're doing is using visual storytelling to tap into my emotion to get my logical brain to go, oh, I want that. Right. I mean, it's a fascinating thing. And I learned this when I was studying addiction for the cannabis work, which is we have extraordinary memory cues about drug use and drug abuse. And what's wild is if you can disrupt, people will have a tendency to drink or do drugs in the same places. And if you can disrupt what scientists call the place preference, you can actually help break that pattern. So this idea that your brain gets really used to doing certain things, and if you can tap into that with your storytelling, then what you can do is you can have somebody come to a realization, whether it's about, oh, I'm smoking too much weed or, wow, that's, that's a, I really want to go, you know, 
by a widget. <laughs> now, this is the last question, and this is a completely other show, and I might just have to have you and Randy back for this one. But is Trump particularly good at this? Oh, he's unbelievable. I mean, I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, the thing is, that's what's scary about the charisma of authoritarian figures is is that they they appear so powerful because they're just doing it their way. There, and everybody wants that sense of agency personally. So you know, he's basically what you've got with Trump is the king of butt in Andy's, you know, yeah. Randy's A- ABG. Yeah. He is so surprising and unexpected and off the cuff and frankly entertaining because of that, that he gives people a sense of power who don't currently have it. That's and that can be really dangerous. Yeah. You know, I called Randy the day after the election and got him to record a show for Business of Story. And he goes, I can't I can't record. I'm just too upset. I go, that's exactly what you need to record. And it was one of my most downloaded shows. So if you haven't heard it out there, folks, go and check out Randy Olson. I don't have the show number in front of me. It'll be in the show notes. I even got some hate mail on that show. So one and only time I ever got hate mail because people thought that we were glorifying his narrative intuition, as Randy calls it. And I said, no, 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 we're not glorifying it. It's just we're trying to reveal the magic. You have to be able to understand the magic to combat the spell. You got to know what he's doing to you. Exactly. And again, you asked me well, how I got into cannabis. That's exactly why. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand what it is about this and avoid the harms. And the truth is, you could say the same thing with Trump. You really want to understand him because then you reduce the potential negative impacts he might have along with any positive ones. <laughs> What a wake up call. Michael, thank you so much for being here today. Randy set this interview up. I'm so glad he did. I just really appreciate you taking the time to be being on Business of Story. Where can people learn more about you and 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 find your book on cannabis? You can find my book on Amazon or, or Barnes & Noble or any of the independent uh, book selling sites. As far as a uh, web presence, I really don't have one right now. I'm still kind of in stealth mode. I think you find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest place to find me right now. <laughs> and also, I, I answered enormous amount of questions on Quora. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm on Quora a lot. Yeah, Quora. So if you are interested in Michael's work in the cannabis world, his book again is Cannabis Pharmacy, The Practical Guide to Medical Marijuana. And I'm going to have to get this because I think it's fascinating, but I'd also like to see how you are using storytelling to reframe the positioning and branding of cannabis to have a bit huge impact in the world. I'm I'm just trying to add a lot of ABT and basically (laughs) just make it really interesting. There you go. Well, thanks, Michael. And thank you all for listening to this edition of the Business of Story. If you like what you hear, hear, share it with friends, share it with family, share it with colleagues, other people that you feel like it could really benefit by helping them get their story straight. You know, whether it's their personal brand story to grow their influence, it's their professional brand story to grow their company. As Michael said, really, a corporation is nothing more than a story that everybody is buying into. So we have found that make it a purpose-driven story. It's going to leave your bottom line without you even having to worry. And think about that bottom line, because stories connect us on a very human, primal level and, and move us to action. They actually change behaviors. So if I can help you on that, visit me over at businessofstory.com. You know I've got a ton of tools, free tools for you to download and start working on your story to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And of course, I bring you this show every single Sunday. So share it with your world and join me again next week when we will have another brilliant story artist like Michael here helping you tell the most potent stories you possibly can. And remember, that story is always the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. And until next Sunday, have a wonderful life.